My name is Doug Kreiner. Uh, I'm a professor of political science, uh, and it is my distinct pleasure tonight, for the first time ever, to actually introduce to a big audience like this uh, my wife, Jillian Goldfarb, who is a professor uh, <laughs> of mechanical engineering and also in the department or the division of material science and engineering. So Professor Goldfarb received her PhD uh, from, <clears throat> I see, I hear all the feedback, so <laughs> if I see uh, uh, people in the back are saying they can't hear. I'm sorry. Professor Goldfarb received her PhD from Brown University uh, in chemical engineering. Uh, her dissertation research uh, had to do with understanding vapor intrusion of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are among the most toxic pollutants at Superfund hazardous waste sites. Uh, since receiving her PhD, her research has branched into a host of other areas involving the intersection of energy and the environment. Uh, so what she'll be talking to us about today uh, is sort of a, a stem of some of this work, uh, sort of capitulating it up and then showing some of the solutions that she's been working on in her own laboratory. Uh, while at BU, she teaches courses in mechanical engineering that are sort of standard, like heat transfer. She also teaches intro to environmental engineering. Uh, so thank you very much, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, so, and also thank you for that great presentation from chemistry. As a chemical engineer, I really appreciate that one. Um, I was also taught improperly, it seems. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit to you, uh, with you tonight about some of my research and really a lot of where my research ideas come from and the problems that I see in the world that we can really address all together here at Boston University. Uh, so a quick show of hands. How many people have brushed their teeth this morning? Awesome, I'm so glad your parents will be really excited about that. Excellent. Um, a little more personal. How many of you have either taken a shower or flushed the toilet today? Again, very good for a developed nation. Okay, we're moving on. How many of you turned on a light switch today or used your iPhone or a computer or something like that? Wow, look at that. Hmm, how many of you ate something today? Okay, the world's problems, I'm really sorry to tell you, are all your fault. Oh, shoot. Okay. It's actually all of our fault. Okay. And we all have the solutions for this. All right. We're living in a totally different time now. All right. Things are just changing as fast as they possibly can. We have new research coming out every day. And a lot of that research is being done right here at Boston University. And I hope you all get involved in it some way, whether it's with an engineer or a chemist or with someone who does energy policy or something like that. There's so many opportunities. And I wanted to share with you where some of these opportunities could come from here at BU. So the, the title of my talk is Sustainability Challenge. We hear, we see all these signs around campus, BU is a sustainable place and all that. And I'm here to show you a little bit about what we could do better. Um, and the subtitle is the Food, Energy, Water Nexus. It's about how these three things play together and how they're inextricably linked. So the average American will use about 80 gallons of water per day. The average Ethiopian, two gallons of water. Okay. One quarter of the world's population lives in water scarcity, and another 20% of that lives in a little bit more of an edgy zone where they're not totally sure where their water's coming from. We have it pretty lucky here. So if you had a cup of tea today, sorry, to make one gallon of liquid tea costs the earth 106 gallons of water from start to finish. I know most of you aren't quite old enough, but when you are, <laughs> A gallon of beer is almost 300 gallons of water to produce. Lest the vegetarians not be picked on in the room, a pound of tofu is about 300 gallons of water to grow. A pound of chicken is going to be about five, uh, 318 to 500, depending on where you're sourcing it from. A pound of beef is over 1,800 gallons of water start to finish. And my favorite, a pound of almonds oh, is over 1,900 gallons of water to grow. So if you want to think sustainably about your food, stop eating almonds. No, no, that's not the nature of my talk. I don't want the California almond manufacturer growers to come after me. What I'm trying to tell you here is that everything has a cost, okay? But believe it or not, your food is not the biggest cost to water. And I know that's kind of shocking. The biggest cost to water in the United States is energy. 
specifically thermoelectric power. And thermoelectric, that's not some big fancy word. It means the energy that you're getting from heat, thermoelectric. 48% of your energy that's from the US comes from coal. 48% comes from coal, okay, 48%. 48% of the energy water usage in the United States is from thermoelectric power. Okay, so this is starting to add up a little bit. So lest you think that um, your food is the only source of water usage, well, fishing makes up about 1%. Uh, livestock is, is less than 3%. The next biggest one is irrigation for crops. And then public water consumption, that's everything we're drawing. Okay, domestic is like people who have their own wells and are drawing their own water. We fall into that public water. Okay, so this is about where your water is going in the US. 48% to thermoelectric. Where is it going there? Like, what are you talking about? I need heat to get energy. Well, you need a little more than that. So in case you didn't know it, I know a little bit about coal. So I thought I'd share a little bit about coal for you because 48% of your energy is coming from coal. So where's the water coming from? Well, first you have to mine the coal, right? Most people don't ever stop to think about that. Your fuel has to come from somewhere. So we have to mine it. Then you have to wash a lot of it. Believe it or not, you actually have to wash it. You have to get some of the metals and some of the sulfur out because if you were to burn it with those things in it, we have major air quality issues. So you have to wash it. Then you have to transport it. Most of our coal is either rail transported or it's transported over water. Oh my gosh, more water. Then you burn it, not too much water usage there. Then somehow you have to generate electricity from it, right? You don't just burn the coal and then all of a sudden your computer starts working, right? It doesn't work that way. What happens is that the coal burns and it gets to a really hot temperature, right? And it heats water up and it makes water into steam. That steam drives a turbine, which spins and gives you your electricity, which then goes through the power plants and then you get to charge your laptop, okay? Now, a lot, of, a lot of power plants reuse this steam. They condense it back and they reuse it through the cycle. Great. The problem is every time it goes through the cycle, it wastes at least 8% to evaporation. So that's 8% that then has to be used every single cycle, every single time they burn coal to replenish its own thing. And then it gets discharged as warm water. So temperatures are going up now. And then you still have to dispose of the ash from the coal. And a lot of times these go into containment ponds, which are mixtures of solid and liquid, because you can imagine if you put ash just on the ground, it would all blow away, right? So they have to be made into a slurry. So this is just one example of where all the water to generate electricity goes. Right? And you may say, well, but you know, professor, I've heard there are all these amazing renewable energy technologies. My lab works on them. I think they're amazing too, but there's problems, okay? So how many of you have seen a set of solar panels maybe, right? Who thinks they look awesome and like so cool? I just love them, right? Um, anyone know what the payback period for the environmental life cycle of a solar panel is? Sort of guess. Seven years. Seven years minimum with all the environmental resources they use, it takes seven years to make it better than generating the electricity from coal. Okay, the average life is only between five and 10 years. So you can see we have a few problems there. So solar also uses high water. A lot of times you have to cool the panels with water. And it has a really high land usage, right? You see fields of solar panels. Those are fields that could otherwise be used to grow food. Oh wait, water? food, energy, all competing for the same resources. So, so weird. Wind is, uh, it's a little better, a little better. Not as much water. You need some water to mine uh, the minerals to make, you know, the steel. You need, you need some water to make the cement. Not nearly as high of a water content, but still a pretty high land content, right? Or if you're into offshore wind, you got to use some sort of offshore water content. Okay. And then biomass, variable water, and variable land. So in my laboratory, we use second generation biofuels. What does that mean? It means we're using residues from stuff. So maybe municipal solid waste. Okay, well that's good because then we're not putting it into a landfill. And maybe we're using things that are left over from growing crops like corn stover. So that land is already being used for fuel. 
Then you have things like algae. That can be a plus or a minus, right? If you're doing it in contaminated waters to clean up the water with the algae, well, that's a win-win for everybody. You're not using land and you're cleaning water. But a lot of the algae um, ponds that are growing are using fresh water, right, originally, and they're taking up really big swaths of land. So not so good. And this can keep going. You can really find issues with any sort of renewable energy. That's not to say that they're bad, right? It doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. It means that we have to be a little bit smarter about using our renewable energy. Okay? So first generation biomass sources were the things like uh, corn ethanol. How many of you guys have seen a flex fuel vehicle and you're like, yeah, it's on corn ethanol, right? Well, the problem is, is that producing that ethanol from corn, it's really not a very efficient process. And we started growing corn for ethanol and we stopped growing it for food. So we have a bit of a trade-off here. You have people that are food poor that now don't have any subsidy food because the corn land is now being used for corn to ethanol land. Um, so each country is dealing with its own problem in this way. Okay. So, let's see if this works. Or not. There we go. So here's the food, water, energy nexus, okay? So water to food. Well, you need water to grow food, right? Given. And food is a source of water. Okay. Then food to energy. You need energy to be able to produce food, right? Most of our um, vegetables, if you're, if you're getting them hothouse grown or greenhouse grown, are produced by putting energy into something, right? In the winter in New England, you're not actually getting you know, nature's grown produce if it's grown in a greenhouse, right? Someone's had to heat it, someone's had to make it moist, someone's had to do something to it. So you've used quite a bit of energy. It may be locally sourced, and that's great. It means that transport is less, so CO2 emissions are less, but you still have to use energy to produce that food. And then the same way, food can be used to produce energy. So we have competition for land to grow food and to grow things for energy and to position things for energy, like wind turbines and solar panels. And finally, energy and water are tied because you need water to generate energy. Thermoelectric power plants need water. Nuclear power plants need water. Biomass to biofuel plants need water. Solar energy panels need water. So that's a bit of a trick. And then you need energy to be able to supply water, right? Everyone takes for granted the fact that you turn on your tap and water flows out. Do you ever stop to think about how that water gets to your tap in the first place? Right? It's, it's a given. It's there. I remember, I want to say five years ago, um, when Professor Kreiner and I were living in Miles Standish Hall. Anyone here from Miles? Yeah, maybe one or two. So we're living there, and all of a sudden one day, we can't turn on the water anymore. Like, what just happened here? This is what, a week before graduation, people are panicking because there's no water coming out of the taps. The whole city of Boston's water supply was potentially contaminated. We had no water, right? There are people bringing us water bottles. We're like, everyone's complaining. Oh my gosh, what is this? I don't pay for this. Like the whole city of Boston's water was shut down. And it was a wake up call to a lot of people in this city. Unfortunately, I don't think it lasted very long that water, energy, land, everything's tied together. And we just take this for granted that it happens. So this cycle is where I think a lot of people, if you're looking to be one of those cutting edge, I either have something to do with a new buzzword, water energy nexus, I wanna go into policy and relevant policy, this is kind of where our field and sustainability is going, is to talk about this water energy nexus. So in my laboratory, we're working on solutions for this, and I of course invite any of you to stop by and find out about it. Um, we're working with second generation biomasses, so we will take a lot of garbage in the lab. We have a whole nice characterized store of it. And we come up with integrated processes to make liquid biofuels. So these are things that the Department of Energy says, we need liquid fuels. You know, our, de our Department of Defense needs fuels that we don't have to rely on uh, different energy areas for. We don't want to keep drilling. Um, we're now drilling in the Arctic to find oil. So we'd rather not do that. We'd rather make our own liquid fuels from more sustainable sources. 
And we're looking at ways to make um, different byproducts at the same time. Because one of the principles of sustainability and of green chemistry is that why do just one thing with one process and a ton of material when you can do many things at once using the same materials at the same time? It means your processes cost less in terms of an environmental hit and your products tend to cost less because you're making more things at once. So in my lab, we've been making some fun new nanoparticles to do things like um, drug interaction treatments and uh, different ways to upgrade different fuels at the same time. So that's kind of what we're working on here at BU. And I hope you guys will stop by and see us. If you're interested, uh, you're more than welcome to contact me and I'm sure my students would be happy to show you around. I think we have some time for questions, if anyone has any questions. Oh, coming. Uh, oh, that's loud. Um, how do other renewable energy sources, such as geothermal, like how do stuff like that play into water usage and uh, like, is that more or less than solar and uh, wind and bio, whatever, yeah, biomass? That is a great question. Um, so there are many other sources, right? Geothermal is one of them. And the answer is, and this is a horrible answer, what every professor loves to get away with is it depends, okay? And the reason it depends is there are um, a lot of externalities that go along with geothermal. Some water sources are super high in sulfur so you have to spend a lot of energy and a lot of money scrubbing that sulfur out of the water before you can put it into a turbine, because otherwise your turbine's gonna corrode. Oh, that's something we teach in mechanical engineering, by the way, a lot of stuff like that. Why is this process gonna depend on this material and this chemistry of it? So others, though, if you have a really fresh uh, geothermal source, are much better for the environment in terms of a total life cycle, uh, so they would compare more favorably. So it really depends on the source of the water. Uh, whoa, my. Okay. Uh, you said you were making liquid fuel out of garbage. Does that, is that only biodegradable garbage, or can it also be things that wouldn't degrade on their own? And uh, how does that work? It's a good question. Um, so we would call it any organic waste. I don't mean that it was grown in a specific way and has a USDA stamp on it by organic, right? The chemists in the room will appreciate the fact. When I say organic, I mean carbon-based. Right, so anything that's carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, basically things that don't have metals in them. So a plastic bottle, we can take that and we can turn it back into oil. And that's where the plastic came from in the first place, right? Your plastic actually comes from fossil fuels that are refined down and they make plastic. So we're basically reversing the process. Yes? Well, thank you so much, and I really encourage you to stop by.